Hi, and welcome to today's episode, where we have the privilege of hosting Jürgen Rasmussen, a pioneering figure in the world of psychological exploration and change. Jürgen is not just any therapist, he's known for being a master of change. He's the author of the groundbreaking books Provocative Suggestions and Provocative Hypnosis that have challenged conventional therapy approaches. Jürgen has dedicated the last two plus decades of his life exploring and teaching the nuances of human behavior, change, and the profound impact of our thoughts and emotions on our physical health and performance. Jürgen is a friend and mentor, and I have worked with him several times to gain self-awareness and uh, realize the importance of working with our own narratives and how these processes can lead to profound changes in our lives. Uh, all the way from resolving addictions and emotional struggles to overcoming blocks that hold us back. In recent times, Jürgen has shared some very insightful YouTube episodes. I encourage everyone to check out his YouTube channel, uh, where he's done everything from curing allergies to one remarkable case of spontaneous remission from cancer in a female client where he explores a metacognitive framework developed by Jürgen called the psychological illusion model. So this, to me, just demonstrates how powerful the interplay is between our thoughts, emotions, and our physical health. It's, it's not just, you know, doing everything we can with the training and nutrition, but, but also how we, um, how we think about ourselves and, and, and how we think about our own thoughts. So, um, Jürgen, welcome to the to the show. It's thank an you, honor to thank have you, you for having me on and for the kind words. So, could you share with us the journey that led you to develop your quite a unique approach to to therapy and change? I know you've been through uh, all of them, basically. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, you know, when I answer questions like that, I kind of feel that I'm making them up in a sense, like yeah. just guessing and making a coherent story. Um, I, I would say for me, I, I, I don't have a dramatic uh, backstory. I don't have a traumatic childhood. You know, my parents were nice, uh, relatively unremarkable. Um, who knows really uh, how I got into this, but I, I would say that the main driver is curiosity. Um, I, I'm intensely curious. I, I love to explore these topics. For, for some reason, uh, that curiosity regarding these topics has, has always been there. Um, I can think of one event that I think has uh, something to do with it. When I grew up, uh, I had a very distant family member uh, who uh, who had a cancer remission, and he had he, he had stage four lung cancer. He had never smoked. He was essentially toast, and th there was nothing that could be done for him. And he lived uh, outside of Molde in in Norway, and uh, he was a very religious man, and it was part of this religious community, and and they prayed for him. And, and during this prayer service, he, he, he felt that he was healed. And he went back to the hospital later and, and he had a remission. And, you know, they, they redid the tests and cancer specialists came from all over the place. And there was no medical explanation for this. And um, I can't quite remember how many years, but I think maybe 10 or 15 years later, his wife died and they were extremely close. And then he said, you know, I want to go as well. I, I don't want to live anymore. And, and very shortly thereafter, he had cancer again and, and, and then he died. Wow. And I always found that to be just such a fascinating thing. Now, of course, I won't claim to know what happened and I'm not a religious person. And uh, it, it could be a fluke set of coincidences like like. But, but, but I thought, what on earth is going on with this? Like, like, like this is, this is fascinating. Mm. So I, I, I think that thing and a few other things was kind of always in the back of my mind in terms of like, what could be possible and what might be going on here? Well, 
but 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 yeah. again i might have been just as curious hadn't it been for this you know so True. Uh, yeah and it's it's i i just always found your approach to be very unique where you tend to challenge conventional wisdom and and go into like the fringes of uh every field and you know in, instead of going with uh everyone else you you kind of try to always challenge something and i'm myself a big fan of um first principle thinking where huh. you can never be sure of anything unless you have try to uh, understand the opposite uh, argument. Yeah. And I think I, I think just to shoot something into uh, e even in telling that story, I, I think that the field of psychology should and I always put shoulds in quotation marks because it's just a BS story in a sense that things should be in a particular way, right? But mm. it should have changed in the 70s when uh you probably read about these split brain patients who, who who had these very intense epileptic seizures and these neurosurgeons kind of cut the corpus callosum to, to to sever the connection and the whole the whole idea was that by doing that the the, the seizures wouldn't build up so much and spread all over the brain and and for these patients whose life were ruined by these epileptic seizures that this was a miracle it, it, it really really helped yeah. but but then of course the big question was what's going to happen with these people when we've kind of severed the connection between the hemispheres and and they seemed normal and, and were in a sense but for the first time you could kind of communicate with hemispheres independently and there were all these studies done where you would like show let's say a suggestion to 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 move to the right hemisphere mm. and then when people moved they would get stopped and you ask the left hemisphere you know why are you moving and of course the 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 honest in quotation marks answer should have been something to the effect of well actually i have no idea <laughs> or, <laughs> yeah. or, or i i haven't really been in touch with the other the right hemisphere for a while Mm. So I don't know what's going on, but what they discovered was that the, the, the left hemisphere, that interpreter, that Michael Gazanaga, you know, uh, used to call the, the, the left hemisphere uh, interpreter, would just make something up. Would just, would just create a story that sounded plausible and just deliver it with utmost confidence right? yeah <laughs> like even though it all had nothing to do with anything that 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 was going on and i think in i i think that's one thing that's kind of become apparent in psychological research over the years is that we are also largely like that I'm not saying that our explanations have nothing to do with what's going on but even when we have no access to what might be going on or we're you know mistaken our our left hemisphere seems to work like this press secretary that that just kind of makes something up that more or less sounds good and 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 the reason why i so if i may share just one one particular experiment around this so there, there's one experiment where you take heterosexual men and you show them two women who obviously look different but they're, they don't look completely different like Let's say they're, they're, they're both blondes, for example. So you have blonde A and blonde B. And you ask them, you know, who do you find the most attractive? So let's say they say A. I, I like A. So the, the pictures are turned down and there's this sleight of hand trick. So sometimes when they turn A back up, it's actually B that, that they see. Wow. So when this happens, over 70% now begin to tell a story about why they chose the exact woman they didn't choose. <laughs> That's the most yeah, attractive, yeah. and they don't <laughs> and, and they don't skip a beat. Right. Well, the, the the implications for life is like if you look at so much of psychotherapy and so, so much of the way we you know why did you do that and, and and how does that it it should in quotation marks give us all some extra humility and yeah. and caution and perhaps the most intellectually honest answer is I don't know. <laughs> But not yeah. the lazy. I don't know. I don't give a shit. I don't know. But but this this may be all made up in in a sense. 
Yeah, exactly. And that's what I find so fascinating because I also have had plenty of clients that spend years in, in therapy and basically just exploring their ther their um, their narratives. And, uh, you know, Jordan Peterson is, is uh, a, a very well-known psychiatrist uh, these days. And, and um, he's, um, you know, uh, always talking about this, um, you know, extensively the, about the roles of narratives in personal development, how, um, how these can affect our emotional well-being today and, uh, you know, create blocks that tend to prevent us from achieving, you know, uh, a, a good life in a sense. And, and that kind of also ties into you know, your, your own case studies about um, curing allergies and, and uh, even, uh, you know, cancer remission in, in a female client where you, you, you're you kind of challenging that perspective. I mean, you, you um, in, instead of thinking that we're, we're um, like a function of our stories, it's, it's more like a relationship to our stories that it, that is challenged so that we can perhaps let go of them in a sense, can can you explain further what what you what you yeah. have discovered there? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I'll I'll give you a thought. I, I, I must specify too that I, I don't really make any claim of curing anything uh, with course. a method, but I I think one thing that so this mind body we're brought up in a society that that. Even though we kind of know better, the, the, the narrative of a mind-body split is very dominant in our culture. We talk about physical things and psychological things. And th there is usefulness in making those distinctions. But we've kind of forgotten that we've made them up. Um, and and as a result of that, you know, people, I think it, it impacts people's capacities to, to change things when, when they develop some sort of, let's say a disease or certain symptoms and, and they label it as strictly physical, you know, in a sense, and that contributes to them not looking at their inner experience at all, or the quality of their relationships and, and how there might be a, a connection between the two. Um, so often, even just introducing that and getting people to think in that direction can make a huge difference. And I, I think a lot of people who have seen clients, like seen a lot of clients, have had the experience of you, you work with someone and they create a massive shift in, in themselves, you know, at the yeah. level of identity and, and, and they're, they're, they're doing a lot better and <clears throat> not always by a long stretch, but not that seldom either. They report that certain things that have always been defined as physical is either very reduced or it's mysteriously disappeared. Right. And, and if, if you see that enough times, you kind of begin to suspect that, well, well wait a minute. We can't necessarily prove a cause and effect relationship, but there, there, there's so many of these interesting coincidences. I had, a, I'll, I'll share a, an interesting case with you. I, I, I worked with a woman recently in Mexico City who, who had spent many years with her husband in Spain and they moved back to Mexico City and on the plane, so she had no allergies in Spain. Mm. And on the plane back to Mexico City, her allergies, you know, came. I can't remember if she had ever had them before or not, but she had like very strong allergic responses, which her doctor said were to dust, among among other things. So but very intense uh, uh, allergic responses. And... Um, and they, they would increase every time she was around her sister. So, so a, a, after, and I, I kind of helped, helped her see the connection between her symptoms and what was going on. And, and she discovered that by getting clarity on how she perceived her sister and 
her expectations and her boundaries, mm. those particular symptoms completely went away. <clears throat> but I, I, I think for a lot of people, those things don't happen because they don't have a model of the world that opens up for it. Um, so it, it's a very, I'll add one more thing too. There, there's this psychologist called Ellen Langer, who's done very interesting work. And she, she did this study where she took uh, chambermaids, you know, at, <clears throat> at hotels and kind of did some calculations about, <clears throat> you know, how, how many rooms they did every day and the stairs they walked and, and all sorts of stuff. And she, she had one group that she essentially just instructed them of that. And the other group, they just presented it as, you know, you're kind of doing exercise when you're doing beds, you're, you're working these muscles, you know, when you, when you walk the stairs, it, it can affect your body like this. And they were essentially <clears throat> primed to think of it as exercise. And I can't quite remember the time stretch, but when they followed up these groups, and this is a replicated experiment, they found quite a bit of difference. Like the, the exercise group had a lot of the benefits of exercise mm. that the, the people who just thought about it as work didn't have. So not just, and, and they were doing the same stuff, mm. but, but I think for most people, exercise is, is a category that, that connects to something you do on your spare time after work and, and, but just helping them to frame it that way and to see it that way actually influenced their physiology. Yeah, there, there was a similar experiment actually with, um, they had two groups of, uh, of subjects. Uh, one group was instructed to just go for a walk and enjoy the fresh air. And the other was uh, instructed to uh, go for a walk to burn calories. Huh. And after, uh, the walk, they had free access to a uh, buffet and the group that was told to go for a walk to burn calories ended up eating 30% more afterwards than the group right, that was right. just, yeah, getting yeah. fresh air. So yeah. mind, mindset frame is um, very important. And it's, <clears throat> you know, one thing that's so interesting to me too, because I kind of come from a hypnosis background and one thing that I've that's become more and more clear to me throughout the years is that so many people think of hypnosis as a tool of discovery, like that you're, you're discovering things in hypnosis. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that you don't, but I think a lot of what's being discovered is actually being constructed. Right. And, and we, 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 we kind of fail to, we, we often kind of fail to realize that. Mm. Um, so there, there's a very there's a very famous uh, or famous story, but but uh, John Grinder, who was a co-founder of NLP, and Richard Bandler, one of the other co-founders, they spent time with this family therapist called Virginia Satir, and they were in a room watching her work with a family, and 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 the the father in the family is you know he's he's angry and frustrated, and she's getting him to to express his anger. And then after having done that, you know, she, she looks at him and she says, now that you've so eloquently expressed your anger and your frustration, would you be willing to share the deep hurt and vulnerability behind the anger? Yeah. And to everyone's big surprise, except Virginia, you know, th this grown big man just walks out into, you know, deep sadness and, 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 and deep hurt. And the big question is, did they discover the, the hurt behind the sadness? Or, or to what extent was it kind of suggested as an experience mm -hmm. in, in that moment? And, and I think it's extremely, it's yeah. extremely hard to know. It, it's extremely hard to know. So I, I, I think even in these kind of mind body remission cases, if you suggest that there might be a connection to something and they look for something and it it has emotional resonance and they change their story and and something happens like did, to what extent did you discover that and to what extent did you just create a new story that they then 
responded to. Right. And I, I, yeah. I think it's extremely difficult to know. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm like, again, after having worked with uh, clients for over two decades and, and in most recent years, or through, you know, one-on-one -on -one, uh, interactions, it's it's also very, uh, you know, I, I one framework I like is that there's like three levels of mind. And I know you, you are also um, a proponent of this, that we have like uh, the content of our thinking, which like cognitive behavioral techniques, like we explore what you are thinking uh, all the time. And then at the level above that, we have our thinking strategies, you know, how we use our thinking. Yeah. And then at the very top level is the metacognitive approach where we just realize that we are thinking. Right. And that's kind of like the source of everything else below it. It's, it's like an, the umbrella that all the other forms of therapy and, and understanding uh, belongs uh, in. And, and so um, it, it's very fascinating. And this probably also ties in with, you know, Robert Keegan's psychological development stages that it requires a certain structural capacity to, to even get to the point where you understand that thoughts are just thoughts. Oh. And emotions are just emotions where you can be the observer of the process of having thoughts and emotions. So, because I've, I've tried discussing this with, with some of the younger clients and, and they're just not quite there yet. Uh -huh. uh, but, but in, in, in your experience, would you say that getting to that level of understanding is like kind of the ultimate uh, should be the ultimate goal so that we can be free of or liberated of uh, like the prison of our own thinking and emotions. What, what, what yeah, are your I, I, uh, experiences? I've, I've learned to be more and more skeptical of, of ultimate goals, but it, it's interesting what you mentioned. My my daughter, who's soon to be 12, asked me, you know, uh, a year ago or so, like, Dad, if you could give me a superpower, that was mm. like the topic, you know, what superpower would you grant me? You know, and she looks at me with expectancy and and, and I tell her, well, if I were to give you a superpower, you know, it would be the 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 ability to not believe everything you think. And mm. she it just looks at me with such profound disappointments. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like is is that is that what you came up with? Like like yeah. <laughs> like that's so boring. That you know that's so stupid. I was like, oh, you have no idea what, what mm. superpower that would be. Like like that's exactly. that's. And I said, and if I were to give you a curse. It, it would be that you would have to believe everything you think. Like, mm. that's hell. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it certainly is. There, there, there's a real, there's a real, so I, I, I think, you know, and I see this with a lot of clients too, that, that you know, people, people think, but they may not necessarily think that much about how they think. Mm-hmm. In the sense of, you know, well, how am I making sense of this, and 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 how how am I making meaning, and, and mm. realize that they are thinking that. So I I think one useful distinction is, let, let's say that you have a dream where you're you know kidnapped by aliens in a spaceship or something, and you're fighting. You know, like one thing is to try to fix things in the dream as the dream character. I'm not saying that there isn't value to that because that's kind of how we live in a sense. But th th there's also the opportunity of like waking up from the dream and realizing that the whole thing is kind of made up to some extent. Mm. And, 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 and to then to be able to engage with it on a more, I think there, I, I think there's a lot of freedom to be found here. I, I very often use movie analogies with people where I, I say to them, look, when you, when you watch a really good movie, you know, they can, they can have a range of emotional experience. You know, they, they might be crying. They might be touched. They might be angry. They might be scared. They, they, they might experience it. And that's often how they know a movie is good. Because they've they've been emotionally impacted, they've been on a on a journey. But even the so-called negative emotions, you know, the the fear, the sadness, the 
during the movie they they're, they're not stressed by it in the sense of trying to figure things out or ruminate or have to make it go away or 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 they can kind of enjoy the fear and the sadness and 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 when the scene shifts the feeling shifts and when the movie's over it's it's kind of over yeah. and i think that the more you are able to see thoughts as thoughts relatively the more your experience can be like that meaning you can still feel strong feelings and you can get absorbed into things but things don't kind of kind of look real in in the same way they don't look scary in quite the same way right and it's it's very interesting also that connection because um you know the brain being a meaning making machine we we always try to look for patterns and causes mm. of how we're feeling uh, at any one time and it, it's like just this was well, like mondays is usually when i go through uh, progress reports from clients and it's like the, the common theme of, um, well, I had some digestive upset. Uh, I, I had some nights of poor sleep. Uh, I had feelings of being stressed out. And how they tend to always point to the same things. Well, it's my boss. It's uh, the dairy products or, or the gluten. Yeah. Or it's the fact that, you know, they, it's kind of like they're just making things up. It, it's probably that. And so now I'm going to try low carb or I'm going to try to not eat the dairy products for a while. Or, mm. you know, uh, going on vacation or taking a break from work will lead me to sleep better. So it's always like externalized. And, and they don't take the time to explore what's actually going on on the inside. Yeah. That's where I see the, the challenge lies. Yeah. And it, it's it's so interesting too, like like how we often don't see that the time itself is 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 a thought construct. Like there, there's no Monday yeah. in nature. Uh, but how powerful the concept of a Monday can be in shaping our experience. Yeah. It's it's and I mean as a tool, you know, the fact that you and I can show up at ten o'clock and you know, on Tuesday, and we, 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 we can construct that as consensus reality, and it, it's functional. It, mm-hmm. it works. And, and then the question for me becomes, like, to, to, to what extent is there an awareness that, that this is a particular way of framing experience? I, I, I remember after my last, uh, not my last, the one before that, my mother's mother died. Uh, this was back in 2001 and i was dealing with the people from the 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 funeral service you know and and this guy was on his break and i went outside and i talked to him and we we got great rapport and i started asking him questions because i'm curious and i was like well how is this business and how does it work (laughs) he he kind of forgot his professional demeanor it was hysterically funny so oh yeah this this time of year is good you know ah, they start dying off you know right he got so he he, he got he got so enthusiastic and then and and then he kind of caught himself because he 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 saw me in the role of the like grieving and i was like no no just just go on this this is hilarious i i thought it was hilariously funny we had we, we had a belly laugh at the kind of the inappropriateness of the enthusiasm around this this sort of stuff exactly. but, but i remember him telling me and I've, I've heard this from people who work in hospitals and stuff like that too that that you know very often right after vacations uh more people will die and and mm. <clears throat> i think it's monday morning or the the night before monday morning exactly where yeah. more people will die than, than any attacks. statistical time yeah you know and so, so, so that that's like a that's like a real thing, and I, of course, I don't know, but I would wonder if that applies to crocodiles or, yeah. you know, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> probably not because they, yeah. they they don't have Monday mornings. It it, it doesn't exist. Yeah, and, and and that that's the that's the fascinating thing about us humans that we 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 can create the concept of Mondays and, and the work week, and it's. It's it's damned useful in a sense, but yeah. but these concepts too also shape our experience dramatically and have real consequences in a sense. 
Yeah. And it's so it's it's so fascinating. And there's there's a lot of liberation, I think, in just kind of having some awareness of these things. And 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 for for example, I I just made a video yesterday about Bessel van der Kolk and 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 the kind of whole trauma legacy, you know, and these days, you know, so many people are the, the big thing is trauma. You know, people see trauma mm. everywhere that whether their marriage doesn't work or they drink too much or they Trump gets elected president. I'm yeah, it, it, <laughs> it's intergenerational trauma. It's probably intergalactical yeah. trauma soon. Like it's trauma everywhere, you know, yeah. and and what a lot of people don't seem to realize is that. The, the concept of trauma is a particular way of framing your experience. Mm. It, 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 it deeply affects how you experience what you experience. And you, you, you'll tend to experience things that, 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 that kind of fits the category, so mm. to speak. It's, it's, it's not an innocence. And, and we see this if, if we study like the history of psychosomatic medicine and stuff like that, that, it's so fascinating to see that in, in some parts of the world, when people are suffering, they have symptoms that we haven't thought about having. And mm. in earlier time periods, <clears throat> there, there were other ways of suffering that was very popular in a sense that we've completely forgotten about yeah. doing. <laughs> you know, and it, it's, it's, it's extremely fascinating to, to see those things. Mm. Sure, sure. And, um, so, so I guess this kind of brings us to, uh, like the topic of, you know, what, what, what you discussed there also the, the concept of time, because I always, uh, have, you know, the, the challenge of instant gratification versus delayed gratification, where the process of changing your body, you know, going on a diet and training to, you know, build muscle and lose fat is something that. If you don't enjoy the process, it will never be sustainable. So, so you kind of have to, uh, figure out a way to live as the identity of the person you want to become, which is, you know, also known as identity based change. Um, but, but I also see it relating to, you know, confidence, self-confidence and self-worth that tends to come up all the time. And, and I, I really liked. Um, Nathaniel Brandon's six pillars of self-esteem, yeah. uh, which, uh, defines it as a combination of capability and worthiness where capability is our self efficacy. When you trust your own mind and judgment and worthiness is your self respect. It's a belief that you deserve happiness because you're inherently valuable. And so it, it seems to me as if people are trying to um, achieve self-esteem by looking a certain way to get the external validation from from the outside world instead of figuring out a way to actually connect with that feeling through some type of, well, I, I hesitate to call it self-compassion, but, but it's the closest, um, terminology I can think of where it's, it's a matter of accepting your strengths and weaknesses and looking at it as a process of learning and evolving, whatever, you know, um, working with the weaknesses so that they stop becoming a weakness or a limitation. But, but again, that, that kind of perhaps tunes us into the narratives of our own, um, personality and, and, you know, I am the way I am because of my history, you know, because of my parents, because of my upbringing, because of what happened in kindergarten. And, and so I have also found liberation in uh, the psychological illusion model or the metacognitive framework, but, but how again, do we like construct it, it kind of seems as if we, we can just freely construct whatever identity we want, because if we're not actually, I mean, if our narratives, our stories are, are just constructs of the mind anyway, why, why should we, you know, use them to, to navigate our own life? And what, what are your thoughts when, when I, when I say this? Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. 
um, you, you yeah, I, I guess I was kind of rambling you, a bit. So, so let me yeah, try you, to, you to put clarify. a lot on the table there. I'm, I'm not quite sure how to interject yeah, or, or. I, I agree. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm also kind of trying to sort it out myself, which is yeah, uh, yeah. Using the thoughts, the question is is a very, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, disingenuous way to leave it up <clears> to you. Yeah. Um, I, I guess where I'm, where I want to go with this is that we have like the meaning making process of constructing our own identity. So I am Berge and I either have or don't have self worth. And if I feel like I don't have any worthiness, I need to become worthy by, you know, in my case, spending years of building muscle, dieting to look lean, getting respect for being a smart person, and it's it's all kind of externally validated. Whereas the understanding of the metacognitive approach through working with you, I, I started more to challenge those narratives and um, it, it became kind of a liberating way to free myself of these thoughts. But a, a transitory period there, uh, where I, I was kind of lost, you know, well, if I'm not my stories, who, who am I? And it, it became, I, I've had the same experience with some clients where, well, if my thoughts and feelings are just movies of the mind and I stop watching movies, what do I do then? Hmm. You know, where, where do I navigate? Yeah. So, so I guess that's, that's kind of where I'm going. Can we actually achieve? Because some some use this um, working with our narratives, like Jordan Peterson uses this uh, framework of working with our narratives and creating new narratives so that we can become our best self. How does this model fit in with that paradigm? Where um, I guess the ultimate goal of most humans is to just have a better life, be a good person, and perhaps also contribute to society. So in, 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 a, in a very roundabout way, I'm, I guess I'm asking, how do you help a client through this process of exploring through this framework, but at the same time, not losing the sense of self that is essentially how we try to, you know, achieve a, a good life or become a better person. Yeah. Well, it, it, it so depends on the client and kind of where they are and what they're open to. And you, you mentioned Nathaniel Brandon. I, when I was 18, 19, reading his books was like music for my soul, in a sense. I, I, I felt that just growing growing up in Norway at the time, there, there was no literature like that. There was no, like the culture, at least the way I perceived it back then was very groupish. And, and this idea that your life is your own and that you can kind of, you have the right to define things for yourself. And, and it was just a, a, a wonderful read for me. Um, hey. So I, I, I think once again, like, I would be very curious too to see like to 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 what extent these issues of self worth and and to what extent they would be a topic if they hadn't been such a strong topic in our culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm I, I'm not claiming that they wouldn't be at all. I because because in terms of stories, like it, it does seem that we humans have a nature that like there are certain proclivities that. There's there certain tendencies that we seem to have, so it's probably not completely random. Uh, and one example of this would be, uh, and I don't think that evolutionary psychology is the only lens to use for things, because it, it, it can be a very transactional way of thinking, but as one lens, so for example, when I work with people who are jealous or have jealousy issues, I, I see that the evolutionary psychologists seem to be right in, in in the sense that if a guy is jealous 
the thing he wants to know is, you know, from his girlfriend or whatever is, did you have sex with him? Like it, it revolves primarily around sexuality. Whereas the female clients, it, it's not that they don't care about sexuality, but, but, but it's more around, do you have feelings for her? Mm. And this is a, th th this is a pretty, and again, this is a story, but it, it kind of makes sense from an evolutionary perspective that men's fear would be to be cuckolded, you know, in, in a sense. And, and the women's fear would be that, oh, if he develops feelings for this other woman over there, then the protection and the resources, you know, might, you know, end up over there. So cue, cue the feminists now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and, um, yeah, the, the, so I, I mean, we, we do, we do seem, to, we do seem to have a nature too, that, that, that kind of influences that, that kind of influences, uh, I, I've had a, I, I, I like teasing feminists sometimes, you know, I, uh, <clears throat> like, like, like one, one question I've sometimes asked some of them as, as clients who I've said, look, here's a scenario for you. Let's say that you and your husband are, you know, at, at the cabin in the woods, you know, and it's dark and, and, you know, you hear sounds and you, you get this awful feeling that someone's breaking into the cabin, you know, something's going on and you're like upstairs on the second floor and you feel this fear response and let's say that your, your your husband kind of bumps into you and go you know well you go down and check you know and i'll i'll, I'll stay here you know mm -hmm. and, and and like w w without exception you 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 see a an expression of disgust <laughs> like, yeah. like like like, like yeah. something's wrong with this type of irrespective of how much they might talk about equality and sex as a construct and you know so on and so forth there's something there that that, that mm. kind of um, fundamental to our yeah organism i guess yeah yeah so but mm. but i think in terms of the self stuff too i mean one of the things that people like eckhart tolle and 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 the kind of the the, the spiritual teachers you know of our Buddhist times teachings whether and, it's yeah. tolle or byron katie or rupert spira or whoever one thing they all seem to point to is that we often fail to make the distinction between thinking and being mm. like, like there, there, there's this constant process of identification going on where it seems as if being itself shares the destiny of whatever mind state gets produced in the moment. And that's a prison. And, and I think what a lot of, a lot of what I do and a lot of what those people kind of do is, is, is to help people to, to, to really kind of discover that there, there is something which isn't a thing, which is aware of the thoughts and the feelings and, and which kind of remains when the thoughts and the feelings disappear to, to be able to have that, that, that clear sense that, that what you are, so to say, is prior to thinking and feeling. Yeah. Um, and, and for thinking and feeling more to be tools and experiences to navigate life, a bit like Mondays, it's, it's a useful concept. You, you better learn it to, to, to function, really? but, but where it no longer so much looks like who we are. Mm -hmm. Um, I, 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 I think that's a big, and of course things have functions. I mean, if, if someone asked you and me, you know, where are you from? And, you know, we would say we are Norwegian and we're born in Norway and it's true. You know, it's, 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 we could show our passports. And when we go to the airport, we have to play that game. We have to fill out the forms and show the passport and, and, and stuff like that. And I'm not saying that there aren't any differences between groups. If you construct things that way, because there probably are, but, but, but simultaneously, you know, there really is no Norway in the sense that at some time, some people kind of went, you know, over the sea over there that's Denmark and behind those rocks over there that's Sweden and we kind of made that up and then we kind of forgot that we did it right and yeah. this is not an argument for open borders or anything like that but but there, there's a there there's something about being able to show up with your passport and and to know whose bags to pick up at the airport and to be able to 
show up on a Monday because it's functional. Same goes with identity, you know, the sense of self and mm. I better be able to say these are my feelings and that, you know, those, those are you, your feelings. But but all to simultaneously more and more be able to see that the, these are these are concepts and ideas that mm. may be useful and kind of point to something, but they're they're, you know, we, we collectively kill each other over these lines in the sand, you know, and, and we Yeah. <laughs> We we we, 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 kind of, we 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 kind of lose the plots. Yeah, yeah. We, we we start to to feel proud because we're Norwegian, or ashamed because of the the the, the soccer team that lost the game, or yeah. That, that that that's a fun thing to notice too with with sports fans. You know, it's like we won three to zero, but if it's a loss, it's like they played horribly. They they lost. Yeah. Like we yeah, exactly. won and they lost. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same pointing uh, all over again. Yeah. So yeah. I guess and and beyond, um, you know, I, someone told me once that if if everyone would just um, practice meditation or use psychedelics, there wouldn't be any wars anymore. What do you think of that? I, I think that's complete nonsense. <laughs> 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 I've lost. You know, yeah. I've. I've I've kind of lost my faith in absolute end stations like like this yeah. like, like any utopian uh, you know you know for, for me um, I, I I started meditating when I was thirteen fourteen and I'm I'm forty seven so so I have I, I have quite a bit of experience in terms of meditation and exploring meditation and teaching meditation and and, and stuff yeah. like that. And I'm I'm an advocate of it, you know. I, I, I but I'm also very aware that there, there there are dark sides to meditation, and yeah. and there are plenty of people who who have had experiences while meditating that they have not been able to make sense of in a way that's useful for them, and, and it's made their life worse in mm. in 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 that sense. And uh, I think there's a lot of useful insights you can have through meditation but i i don't think neither meditation nor psychedelics are are a, a solution to all of life's and i have to be honest too i think some of the most narcissistic people i've ever met i i've met as part of meditation and non-duality hey. uh, you know groups and also spiritual groups and and uh, among some environmentalists, I, I I mean it's it's uh, it's it's very it's very obvious to me that someone can have tremendous insights on the meditation mats, which are probably legitimate, and they can still be very narcissistic or very immature or or, or not a nice person at all, you know, simultaneously. And, yeah. and th then you can have other people who have never done any of that stuff. And they're decent, kind, honest human beings who, I mean, for the most part, I mean, no one us, none of us are, but I've, I've, I've lost faith in, and it's a bit like psychedelic. I don't have a lot of experience with psychedelics. I, I have a couple of DMT trips and I've done some mushrooms. I, I, I don't have a lot of experience, but I think both with psychedelics and, and meditation, you know, we, we kind of forget that no matter what experience you have, it's still content, you know, in, in a sense, there's always a way of making sense out of that experience. Yeah. And, and, and I think that some of the people who have these experiences where they say that ruined my life or that, that, that just, you know, it just pulled the rug from from and other people who might say that was so liberating and, and everything their subjective experiences may not have been that different yeah but how they made sense out of those experiences m might have might have and, and i think talk about this from kind of a developmental angle as well you know all, all psychological all psychological growth and development simultaneously comes with losses. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll give you an example of, of, of this. Let's say you have a person who, 
they live in a kind of traditional culture and their, their, their roles in life are rather well defined and they may have a pretty black and white thinking style, but, but it works for them. You know, they, 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 they live a pretty functional life. And, um, oh, for some reason I, oh, now you're back. Now I can see you again. Yeah. Something um, with the camera. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Let, let, let's say that they, they meditate or they do psychedelics and they suddenly have the realization that, wait a minute, you know, with a couple of grams of this reality looked completely different, you know, what on earth. And, and that might be extremely freeing, but it might also be terrifying in that, that more old conventional black and white thinking style where they thought i just kind of see reality as it is there was a lot of perceived security and stability and and and, and meaning in that and, and and now suddenly when that has loosened up it's like well what the hell what's right what's wrong what you know mm. And, and this can, for some people, be extremely liberating, and it can simultaneously be extremely destabilizing. I, yeah. I know, for, for example, you know Sam Harris, the philosopher, neuroscientist, meditator? Yeah. Uh, he's, he's written a book called Free Will. I think his argument is very good, especially if you come from a kind of materialist perspective, if, if you kind of... But I... I know people who have read that book and found it tremendously liberating mm. to, to no longer believe that they have free will. But I also know of people who have read that book and several other books who've just plunged into the depths of depression. Right. And, and they kind of reach the same conclusions. Mm. Yeah. Fascinating. And, and um... so I don't think there, there, there's this, there's this economist philosopher by the name of Thomas Sowell, who, who I really like to read, you know, sometimes, and he has a lot of interesting sayings. And one of them is, he says that in life, there's, there's few solutions, there's only trade offs. Right. I, I, I think there's so much wisdom in, in that I, I see in child rearing, for example, like, and this is, this is so stereotypical, that it's almost embarrassing. But like, I see with my wife and I, when we raise our kids, you know, She's on the more feminine nurturing side. And I kind of like to kick their ass a little bit and to, to, mm. to not same, literally, but, but to challenge them and hold them accountable and, and, and that sort of stuff. And, but I'm more into freedom and, and, and of course there, there's no solution to this. It's, it's, it's more a matter of like finding some sort of sweet spot that fu that's functional and which works, which you then may have to renegotiate. And I, I think this is the case of, of meditation and psychological growth and, and this idea that we will someday arrive at a kind of utopian place. Even if you look at people who you probably noticed this yourself too, who, who grow psychologically, meaning you, you get more capacity for self-reflection and seeing other perspectives and you have more access to your inner world and your kind of shadow material you see that conflicts are not just out there there there's also an internal element to it you know stuff like that that brings online new problems in a sense like you suddenly have other things to feel bad about yeah <laughs> that, yeah, that, that you didn't see previously and that fewer people around you can relate to mm -hmm. they may they may not you know th th this whole idea of like the conflict between ah I feel like I have a core self and I'm me, you know, but there's simultaneously this realization that it's, it's kind of made up and how, how, how do I, na how do I navigate that? And, you know, that, that whole, I mean, try having that conversation with most of your family members or yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. most of the people you talk to, they, they, they'll go, Blank are, stare. Are, are, yeah. are, are, are you nuts? Like they, they can't believe in that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And th they've been spared in a sense. And it, it's a bit like, it's a bit like working with people who, who talk about ethical business, like mm. they may have grown and they go, you know what? I, my definition of success has changed when I was 24, they might say it was just about how much money you had in your bank account and that whether you could, 
But now it's more like, well, how did you earn that money? And how are you impacting the people around you? And are, 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 are you doing something that's meaningful? And how does it impact your, your relationship to your kids? And is this ethical? And like, suddenly they're seeing a lot of problems yeah. perhaps in the way they do business that 15 years earlier, they would have gone, come on, you're getting mm. paid. What, what's the problem? I, I and guess we just have, we, we just have a, a need for having problems to solve. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, one thing I very often see with clients and seminar participants is, is kind of an idea that psychological growth or development means less problems in a sense and mm. you, you'll land somewhere but and there's some truth to that it, it it's not that but it's also like but yeah but you're you're also going to find other problems and you'll have other challenges and other things won't matter that much and and hopefully you'll have better skills to navigate the terrain yeah but you can probably be better able to choose your own problems instead of them being chosen for you in in a sense yeah or, or or kind of see that or kind of see that that problem too is is, is kind of a concept and hey. it's a way of framing experience and and you yeah. know there's um this is one of the funny things about change work i think is you know people usually have these if only lists, like if, if only I accomplished this yeah, or yeah. I had that, you know, then I'd be happy. Right. And, and I'm it, not saying that there aren't typical things that are worth having in life. Like it's, it's worth doing something meaningful. It's worth having quality relationships. I, I'm, I'm not knocking it completely in that sense, but, but it, it never takes long until I find a new client who has checked all those boxes and they're just as anxious and they, exactly. And, and, yeah. and they have another list that the previous client ha hasn't even thought about because they think that if I if I only can get married and have kids, mm. then I'll be happy. Mm. Well, as anyone who's married and has kids knows, you know, that brings a whole lot of let's call it, <laughs> problems or challenges that you you didn't even know were there. You didn't even know you could have those. <laughs> exactly. And the so, same thing so, with, you know building muscle, getting lean, those more external goals. I mean, um, I, I've been bigger and more muscular than I am now and, and also leaner and, and competed in bodybuilding. And those were kind of empty, hollow experiences. It was more about the, the challenge of getting there. But once you are there, it's like, is this it? What, yeah. what do I do now? And, and most don't realize that it's, it's as if they have by by even saying that i just want to be i want to be happy i want to be that because they kind of attach some kind of distance from uh where they are now to where they want to be like that distance is like the measure of happiness and, and that yeah. kind of tells me that well it's it's possible to be happy just the way you are and um but, but it's again, it, 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 exactly. people kind of attach drive and motivation to the fact that they're still not where they want to be. So it is kind of also difficult to challenge that. Yeah, it, it, it's this idea that our happiness comes from external objects and relationships. And I'm not going to take a completely extremist view on this because I think, yeah, if, if, if you're with a romantic partner who cares about you and you can have a meaningful life together, you know, that that's that's probably a good thing in, in the sense of versus living with someone who's, who's just being contemptuous and yeah. stealing your money. And so I, I, I'm not, but the thing, the, the thing with relationships and goals is that people tend to come them, come to them from a place of lack of thinking that if I only accomplish this or I get this or I get validated or I get, then I'll be happy. And, and it's an enormous pressure to put on other people, of, of course, and it's a recipe for a, a, a lot of misery because there is nothing there in, in that sense. I, I remember John Grinder again. I used to have him as a kind of informal mentor. He told a story about when he first met his wife, you know, who, who kind of had long nails and, you know, his lawyer, kind of upper class-ish 
he, he, he took her climbing, you know, because he loves climbing and she kind of broke her nails and she got sweaty and dirty and scraped her knees and all sorts of stuff. And, 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 and she got to the top of this, this mini mountain, you know, exhausted and she, she crawled over the top and you know, she cried out, but, but John, <laughs> there's nothing here. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. and, that, and, and, and there, there is nothing there in, in mm. that sense. It's, it's the climb. It's, it's, yeah. it's the journey. It's the, so whatever there's a world of difference between climbing to become enough versus you climb because that's what that's how the life force wants to express itself through you that that's yeah. that's how you express that's how you love to explore so in the same in relationships too you know if, if you can kind of view it as the relationship is where you share and cultivate and express you know all these experiences and, and qualities Mm. It's a very different orientation than coming to them from a place of lack. Yeah. And, and of course, this is one of the things that, that the meditation traditions are kind of teaching us is that when, when the mind slows down enough and we will have these experiences, when there's just the sunset, there's just the skiing, there's, there's, there's just, there's no distinction. We will have these experiences. There is a... A, a joy, a, a happiness of just being alive that's inherent in us. And of course, what happens later is that the conceptual mind kicks in and attributes it to the sunsets. And, and we, we, we start chasing sunsets, right? And, and this is yeah. the big, this, this is the big, like I, I remember a few years ago, I, I, I had this, this amazing experience of, doing gardening and I, I hate gardening in the sense I, yeah. I but it, it was just the right temperature and it was, it was just it was just a perfect flow state experience right for like 90 minutes or whatever that the, there was no sense of separation no and I mean I, I could have later of course later on the mind comes in and looks for causes and explanations yeah. and goes oh it's probably the activity it's probably you know you see this sometimes and it's it's humorous you know let's say you have someone who they, they've seen a sunset or something you know and, and they just have this experience of awe oh, like the the sense of separation disappeared and it's just experience and it's, it's just pure peace and love you know the the whole thing and then they kind of wake up from that you know the conceptual narrative mind you know starts kicking in and 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 attributes it all to the sunsets Right, the, the the sunset made the sunset out there made me in here feel this way. Of course, yeah. this is a thought construct, right? So 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 now they start planning their life around this. Like, oh, I know what's going to make me happy: more sunsets. So I, I I have to get up to catch as many sunsets as I can. And what was I wearing? Oh, I, I had this particular short and singlet, so. I yeah. have to have that one Recreate. ready and I have that cup of tea and I have that yeah. chair. And if, if I only can replicate exactly the, the this, ritual. I can chase yeah. the sunsets, then right. I'll be happy. But, but of course it doesn't work. Hmm. Like, like sometimes you might be able to have that experience to some extent and other times you're just bored and, and, and hmm. for, for some people, that's kind of a wake up call that, that kind of goes, we can't really be the sunset in itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, um, and yeah, it's again like the, the eternal the eternal chase for happiness out there that that's kind of some of the problem and this is what's going on all the time in in my world of training and nutrition where it's that chase for extreme programs and diets to achieve something so that I can be happy whereas I'm more of the well try to explore your experience with these approaches and see what yeah. works for you instead direct it inwards instead of looking out there for experts or opinions or in, you know bodybuilders or influencers to tell you what to do all the time and the the central part of this is that by by calming down and being more indirect experience that's kind of where the sense of true meaning and and happiness exists intrinsically. Yes, it doesn't have to involve if, rituals or. Yeah, 
I, I, I sometimes ask my clients because they go, ah, oh, you know, what, what's the meaning of life? You know, as if I could give them an answer to, but, 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 but I say to them, what if the meaning of life is just life? Mm -hmm. like, like, like this whole idea that there's this meaning to be found and you have this and this, that that's, that's kind of a, you might ask, what's the meaning of looking for meaning in, in, in everything? But, but. I mean, I mean, consciousness itself. I mean, the 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 fact that the fact that we have experience. Uh, if you ask someone, you know, I, I could give you the wealth of Elon Musk and and the, the most amazing women in the world and all the experiences you might want to have, all the accomplishments, but there's a price to be paid. There, there there's no consciousness, mm. yeah. so there's no experience of it. You, you, you could have that, or you could have just the capacity for consciousness itself. You know, what would you choose? And of course, none of this has any value outside of the, the, the capacity to experience in of itself. And, and that's what everything flows out of. Uh, I, think, I think I may have mentioned this in a conversation with you before, but I remember when, when Robin Williams died, you know, the, the comedian. And of course, he had Parkinson's, but he, he struggled with addiction and depression, depression, you know, throughout periods of his life. And and I remember reading about it and, and sitting at the table with my daughter. I can't remember how old she was, but she was maybe three or something at the time. And she was just beaming, you know, that particular day. And, and it just struck me, like, how often do you see a depressed three-year-old? I mean, if you truly yeah. neglect them and you treat them horribly, of course you can. But But like... They're, they're pretty, you go to the kindergarten, you know, with your three-year-old, you know, they're, they're pretty, they play, they're, they're inexperienced, they're, they're, yeah, they, they, they might get grumpy or sad, but it, it doesn't last that long. They're, they're pretty quickly back into the mix. Hmm. And of course, they, they haven't learned how to worry or reflect yet. It, it, it's, it's a bit unfair to give them too much credit for it. It is a bit like giving a, a person who's blind and has no hands credit for not being a pickpocket, you know, yeah. <laughs> in a sense. But, but there, there, there's, there's, something, there's something to seeing that these conceptual minds we have that can plan and, and create these stories can also end up in rumination and worry and yeah. sink our moods and, 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 and leave us in, in, in terrible shape. But, but I remember just looking at her and thinking like, what a cruel joke we're selling our kids to some extent. Cause, cause she's happy. Mm. And the other three-year-olds they're, they're, they're happily exploring. Yeah. And we kind of, implicitly sell them this idea that, well, you know, you can't just be happy. You know, it's got to be caused by something. You have to look like this. You have to earn this. You have to accomplish this. You have to be in control of this. You have to master this. You have to, and then you might have a little bit of happiness, but only for long because the next day you have to get up and do the same thing again. And if you do this enough, then maybe one day you can have a little bit of that happiness that you already inherently are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like, what a cruel joke. And you, 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 and I kind of looked at Robin Williams, who like externally had so much of the success and the fame and the, 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 it, and, but of course his mind translated that into something dark and, and, and looking at my daughter who like on paper had very little of that. And, and she's just, just kind of beaming and, and, and going, you know, what a, but, but of course, then you have the kind of Jordan Peterson perspective too, where he says, no, you're, you're not a, I, I think he kind of, he kind of often doesn't distinguish between rating a person and rating their behavior in a sense. There's mm -hmm. this, but, but this like, no, grow up, you know, <laughs> clean your room, you know, yeah, have yeah, some yeah. standards. Like there, there, there is a, there is something to that as well. Sure. Uh, Cause what we see these days with, with this, this tendency with parenting that's too soft where you you check in with feelings all the time and the kids learn to ruminate and put so much emphasis on their feeling states like it, it becomes mm. such a big a deal yeah. and a lot of the a lot of the extreme emph emphasis on empathy seems to lead to kids who are often crueler exactly. in a sense that's a very so interesting there, there, there's some paradoxes there too yeah
you you you, right. you see some of the some of the people who score high on like agreeableness and and who might be very empathetic because empathy is often presented as the holy grail of human goodness and and but of course empathy is very selective and it's very focused on the one person and that person's plight in the moment uh often at the expense of whoever is deemed as the outgroup right yeah. and, and you see a lot of what's going on these days with you know censorship and safe spaces and group identity and tyranny is is being initiated by people who are often very empathetic yeah but 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 it it can easily turn into something kind of cruel yeah I think good. Jordan Peterson does a good job in pointing out some of that. Yeah, some he does that. for sure. It's it's um his rise to fame has been, you know, a function of um, pointing out these kind of obvious uh, things in in our culture. So huge respects to to him for that. So it's, I, it's, I it's, guess it's to funny, kind of to to, to yeah. look at Jordan Peterson because, and I I really like the guy and I, I think he's doing a lot of uh, a lot of good stuff. And, and, but but if you look at him too, you you see he seems to be suffering quite a bit psychologically often, and he, his mind seems kind of dark in 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 many ways. And but I but I also suspect that that it's partially the price of seeing the stuff that he's able to see. Yeah. Like like as a result of being very smart in the conventional sense, but also having a lot of maturity and a lot of capacity to see things, he sees a lot of stuff that a lot of people don't see. And a lot of it isn't necessarily that nice. And, and, and yeah. Yeah, I can only speak for myself as well. I mean, I'm uh, dedicated my life to help uh, people feel better about themselves. And, and it's coming from a place of knowing w what it's like to not feel good about yourself so yeah. it kind of takes one to know one as well i guess but to me also to go back to that movie metaphor i think um since i've gone through you know the, the meditation nlp hypnosis um all of those understandings and i also like building models and, and strategies to kind of get from point a to point b and the, the movie metaphor I heard the other day, spot on for the, this way of thinking about it is uh, being in a movie theater and, and watching the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And you get so engaged in the movie that for about five to 10 minutes of the movie, you are that scared teenager running from a killer with a chainsaw. And, and you, you, you're physically feeling like you're about to die. Oh. And then someone next to you sneezes and it snaps you out of the illusion. It, it yeah. makes you realize that, wow, I'm just in a movie theater. I'm completely safe. The elevated pulse is just a function of me believing the movie. And uh, you, you're basically back to your feelings that you already had before uh, going into the movie theater. And the psychological illusion model and the metacognitive framework is the sneeze. And I kind of found that to be very, yeah, yeah. That's, that's it. It's you, get, you, you get more freedom in, in the sense that you, you can get absorbed into the movie. And you can also watch it as a critic. Like, like there, there, there's more freedom yeah. to... Observing and in, analyzing in, in, instead of... In, yeah. in, in that sense. But I think I, I think a lot of the kind of perceived need people have for, you know, control and uh, having thoughts and feelings have to disappear and they have to be positive all the time. No one wants that when it comes to a movie. Like mm. if you if you went to the because people people want to be surprised. They yeah. they, they, they want to be touched. They, they want to see something that's outside of their expectancies or outside of a map, you know, like, like, ooh, I, I didn't see that coming. That was, yeah. you know, so, I mean, if you could give people at the movie theater, you know, this, this option of, well, you, you can just design the movie yourself and you can, you can be in con 
complete control over all the scenes. You can predict everything. You can you can avoid anything. Like like, mm. do you want that people go hell no, <laughs> get, exactly. get that yeah. away from me. I, right. I I want the movie experience, and mm. that's because they get film, so they're not yeah. scared by it in the same way. I, I I had a very funny experience of this many years ago. I I worked with a woman for fear of public speaking. And I, I kind of asked the stupid question, how do you know that you're scared? And people often give very different answers to this. There's not one, one anxiety, right? And mm. I, I remember her, her describing the sensations and she was good at getting in touch with it. And then afterwards, she was going to this with her boyfriend to this film club to watch this psychological thriller type thing. And we started talking about that because I liked some of the same movies. And and she said, oh, yeah, I really like the excitement and the suspense. And I said, well, when you feel that, how do you know? And she started describing and she got into it. I suddenly looked at her and I said, do you realize that you're, you're kind of describing the same thing? Hmm. It's like, like, isn't it fascinating that you're, you're paying money to come here to not feel something? And then afterwards, you're going to pay money to feel the same things. And to this. feel the same thing, and, yeah. And, and she just burst out <laughs> laughing. She, she kind of saw the... Because because w- without the label of performance anxiety and 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 you know the the energetics if you will or or, or yeah. just the raw sensory sensations were were quite similar. So so I asked mm. her, what is it that makes one of them worth paying to avoid, and and the other one worth paying to have in the sense of what makes one excitement and one anxiety. Yeah. And she looked at me and said, well, well, but when I see the movie, I kind of know that there's nothing out there, really. Yeah. I said, right. But with the audience, it looked as if her her feelings were a reaction to the audience and what they expected and that they might be judging her. And, 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 there, and there was this, of course, this whole psychiatric framework of mental illness and anxiety, and which then... She she had this epiphany of, of, about that. Yeah. And and also I I guess not wanting to have that experience, being unwilling to feel those feelings, like the the whole what you resist persists. Yeah, yeah, hmm. yeah. A, a friend of mine, and I, it's not his quote. I don't know where he picked it up, but but a friend of mine, James Tripp, he. He has this quote that that is, um, what you can't be with won't let you be. <laughs> yeah. And there, yeah. There, there's, there, there, there's something about that. Mm. But but in the movie theater, like since you understand film, you can watch any scene. Yeah. You might enjoy some of them more than others, but it it's not that big a deal. Mm. Exactly. It's like watching... Movies with my my uh, my girlfriend here, and she's kind of, I, I guess, more in tune with movies. She really feels the movie, and gets angry with the movie, and and has these really strong emotions. And I guess since I understand movie and also understand the psychological illusion model, I I can kind of choose to. Or not. So sometimes I'm just sitting there with kind of a blank stare, and she's really emotional about it, and looking at me as, "Well, why aren't you? Doesn't this, you know, mean something to you? It doesn't this make you angry?" As a yeah, if it if it were to happen, it would probably <laughs> make me angry. But I know it's on the on the movie screen. Yeah, so I, I have... it, it. It can be. Yeah. <laughs> what am I? What are my tendencies? Is I I can get extremely absorbed into. I, I'm very easily touched by things. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so. And my my kids and their friends like to tease me. They they like they they love to go to like the movies with me because I, I I'm one of those people who I'll, I'll start crying at these at these ridiculously banal scenes like it's embarrassing mm. for a grown man you know to to. So I remember I, I had a reflection on this because we, we're, we're so brought up to take our feelings so very seriously, right? And, and to think that they're us. And, and mm. a, a lot of it is just kind of evolutionary 
stuff playing itself out. You know, it, it's cause, so, so last year there was this, since we're both Norwegian, you know, Yuri Skumakegata, you know, this this Norwegian yeah, yeah. Christmas movie. Did, did you that. watch it? Yeah, 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 I love it. It's kind of like, so I, I, I went to I went to see it with my daughter and a couple of her friends and 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 of course for me the floodgates opened. I was yeah. I, I was touched. nostalgic. <laughs> yeah, and 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 they're like teasing me and I'm trying to hide you know because it's so. I was like ah oh, shit you know it got yeah. got me again right, and yeah. then, and and so but but this is this is that empathy thing which there's this identification with even this fictional one person who, who, who has plight, you know, and of course, everyone who works with campaigns know that if you show a picture of a child, it is even a fictional child who seems to be starving mm. people's empathy and they want to change policies. And if you show them 10 kids, you know, that, response just is, isn't there right mm -hmm. and there's evolutionary sense to this if you look at our tribal past but i came home the same night and i turned on the news and i saw news about you know the, the situation in, in uh, israel gaza and the ukraine and everything and i i registered it intellectually but but th there was really no felt response and i I had this belly laugh of like, why would I ever take this system seriously? Mm. Like, like it's, it's, it's so touched by this fictional movie character. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, 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 but in the case of an actual war with a bunch of people, it's like, yeah, kind of process the information, but, but, but it's no. And, and there's nothing personal about it because you realize course, that yeah. that's kind of how the, the homo sapiens software has developed because our, our past is these clans and tribes where you identified with like like our, our brains are probably not even designed to really do that but it, it was of course i i knew this already but it, it, it was such a it was such a powerful experience to just see how biased and 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 how like why would you necessarily take this system that seriously and to me also i think because i was like people can be mad at you if if you don't get sufficiently engaged in whatever disasters are going on in the rest of the world but but to me it's also like Going back a hundred years, we would also we would just have our closest community and our closest network to be concerned about. Yeah. And if someone were suffering, then obviously we would take action or do what we could to help them. But now we're bombarded with images from all over the world, like hours and hours of being on a plane to even get there. And we're kind of su still supposed to be just as much involved in what what everyone is doing. And I think our brains aren't really um, meant to to do that. I think, I mean, just, just look at the statistics. We're feeling more isolated. Even the more social networks we have, we oh. are more socially isolated. And uh, rates of depression, suicide, anxiety are just, skyrocketing so and the world has always been a chaotic place i mean there's been wars raging throughout human history but but could it be that we just haven't understood under understood or learned sufficiently about how our brains work and our meaning making systems work in our thoughts and emotions that this is kind of the missing link in maybe our educational system or something that makes it so that modern humans or even especially youth aren't able to handle modern life anymore and, and our technology. Yeah. And, and I, I think as we talked about previously too, like this, this conflict between, you know, you, you can make up whatever you want, you know, versus there are certain constraints you know human beings have certain proclivities and certain tendencies and and 
it, it's a bit like that experience I had with with the Christmas movie and then turning on the TV and, and just kind of realizing, but but that's what the Stone Age brain is designed to do. Mm-hmm. Like like just seeing that that th- th- there are certain tendencies and proclivities that can easily get fooled by TV and advertising and 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 and, and these sorts Social of things media. and. Yeah. And, and and to also see that there there are a lot of there, there are a lot of like ideological straitjackets that people kind of impose on kids and on all of us that we're we're supposed to be a particular way according to certain ideologies and and but these ideologies might be in conflict with how we're kind of designed to work and and people might feel bad about that not knowing that yeah but it's not really part of the design Mm. so i think there is there's there's elements to that as well Mm. so um we're we're kind of going on time here but to to kind of tie it back to the to the beginning here the the mind body experience and how that can actually affect our health as well um how do you see i guess what's kind of the future of your own uh of your own client work where where do you see yourself going with with this can can this be you know brought to a, a larger world a larger audience somehow how would you see this perhaps helping more people it's it's a good question um i i don't know obviously is is the honest answer i i've never really had that many plans I, hmm. I just love exploring this stuff and I feel happy when I do it. And, and, uh, I love making discoveries. Uh, hmm. but yeah, I would really like to, <clears throat> to, to, to reach more people as well. So, but I, I don't, I don't really know. Hmm. Let's hope I can at least contribute, uh, from this, this yeah. episode. I'm, I also yeah. consider putting this out on, on podcast. So, uh, like on Apple and, and Spotify as well. So I've been getting a request for that. Um, but so Jürgen, th- thank you so much for uh, having this uh, very thoughtful and, and great conversation about these topics that I'm, I'm struggling with as well to, to try to figure out. So yeah, I, um, And I am too. And, and, and yeah. there's, there's something about seeing the, the kind of impersonal nature of that too, to, see, yeah. to, to just see... Like, like, there's this mantra that shows up in, in my in my mind sometimes. That that's just like that's what minds do. Yeah. And and for some reason, for me, there's kind of a relief in that statement, as in, yeah, that's that's what minds do. They create stories. They create comparisons. They look for causes. They that's what that's what minds do. I like that. It's great, great philosophy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so where can people find you, work with you, uh, enjoy yeah, your content if, if, courses? Uh, any English speaking person can find me at provocativehypnosis.com and the Provocative Hypnosis YouTube channel. And anyone in Scandinavia can look at uh, tilstandstraining.com. Yeah. Th- th- those would be the, the places. I'll put the links in the, in the show notes. Thank you. So thank you again. It's been Thanks, an honor Megan. and a pleasure. And I hope I really to enjoyed do the conversation. this. Yeah, hope to do this um, again later. Yes.